And stuff number two, we're going to just park it for a little bit on the on the actual farm stuff. I'm going to go a little bit broader and we're going to talk about what's happening in the wider catchment. And so we've invited Anna Nelson here from King Country River Care. Now, there appears to be a truckload of funding floating around in the catchments at the moment. And you've, sna you've snagged a whole heap of it, I understand. And so I'm um, really interested in uh, how you've managed to snag so much funding and what are you going to do with it. But um, welcome Anna Nelson and... Uh, the floor is yours. And thank you, Matt. My dad says our noses are in the trough and he <laughs> says behave yourselves. But uh, kia ora, good morning or afternoon now. Welcome everyone to the King Country. This is our little part of the world and we're pretty proud of it. Um, it's great to have so many people here. Congratulations, Mark and Felicity. Bloody good job. King Country farmers doing it and um, showing the way. So, yeah, we're really proud of them. Um, I'm going to give you uh, 12 minutes, Matt said, 12 minutes, so real brief on uh, who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing, and then uh, King Country River Care, what it is and what we try to do, and then just a little bit looking forward, and people want to know a bit more about funding and that, so all good. Are we cool? Can people hear back there? Are you happy? Okay, so I'm um, Anna Nelson, I farm just the other side of the Cozzy Club, 1100 hectares with my husband Manta and John and Kay Nelson, my in-laws who are here, and my three teenage kids. So sheep and beef farm, finishing breeding. Um, I trained and I worked as a vet, a large animal farm vet for 10 years, then I um, went to do, had some kids I guess, a little bit less vetting and a little bit more farming and gradually more farming, less vetting, more farming and probably got uh, fairly close to full-time farming. Manta's not here so that's okay, I can say that. And then um, I missed the people in the farms, I suppose, so King Country River Care provided an opportunity to get back doing something where I was working with, uh, with, with other people, caring for them, their animals, their businesses. So... Um, I guess I'll tell you really briefly why I'm motivated to do what I do because it's bloody important. I get up in the morning and I do this job um, because I, um, I guess we farm nine kilometres of Moko River Front, that's our boundary, and we, we've been, John and Kay started it, they've been doing, um, you know, 50 years of work quietly on that farm, working away at it, and we've carried it on. And, we could do whatever we like, but we actually won't change what the river looks like when it gets to the sea or the estuary. The Moko River will still look the same no matter what we do. However, if we all get together as farmers in this catchment, um, we can make a real difference. And it's just taking little, little steps. doesn't have to be big. Um, so that's, that's uh, I guess, reason number one. And number two is my kids. And, um, and actually, it's your kids and all of our grandkids. So, you know, I think um, living... Farming, rurally, our rural communities, oh, oh, it's been magic, I'm so lucky, but I don't think that the opportunity for them definitely to get to live and to farm, um, to make a living on the rural um, country is, is a given, I don't think it's a definite um, in front of them, so I'm really motivated to help, help us all make a little change and um, start to think about what the future generations, what we need to do. To, uh, to give them a chance to make a real go of it. So that's me, King Country River Care. I can't take much credit for the beginning of that. Rion Very, Chairman, and a few of the committee guys are here. You know, they started probably five or six or seven years ago when Plan Change One was first came about, I guess, and it was really in the beginning, King Country River Care was set up because farmers were concerned about the process they were concerned about their lack of representation. They were concerned that Plan Change One might just roll out over the Greater Waikato, potentially um, over wider New Zealand as well, I guess, and what process was being followed. So good job. Um, they were pretty determined and they've, um, they're still going through that process, as many of you are well aware. Two years, just under two years ago, that group said, let's uh, formalise this a bit and um, let's see what else we can do. They put some funding. Those farmers just got on with it themselves. They contracted me to do some work on their behalf and grow it up a bit. Um, we, we became an incorporated society and, yeah, then we moved into a slightly new phase. We're obviously still being involved in policy and regulation was part of it, but 
We also um, took a good look at what was important to us in our communities. We came up with three kind of key goals, and that was around uh, protecting the culture, the economy of our communities, resilient rural communities. Number two was around uh, good farm management practice, enabling, promoting that, so farm environment plans, action plans, understanding your catchment. Number three, uh, oh yeah, policy representation. So yeah, that was kind of where it had started, but we built on that quite a lot. And so uh, that's, turns out, takes quite a long time, a lot of little steps, can't be too ambitious, we chipping away at it. But I have had some, um, we, sorry, King Country over here, here, great support from initially the Waikato Regional Council and they gave us some money a bit, nearly a year ago towards coordinator fees and towards um, I guess getting our strategic plan up and running and then just more recently in the last couple of months uh, central government so the Ministry for Primary Industries have funded us 843000 for the next three years and that's around um, <coughs> planning, delivering supporting our rural communities and our catchment groups to, to have a look at what they're doing, how they're doing it, and identify maybe where some of the first steps are to go forward. And I think that's probably, um, that leads really well into what we're looking at going forward. Um, uh, as Matt said, there's a bucket load of funding out there for, for groups at the moment. And to be fair, it's a little bit overwhelming because that was never kind of why I am here. But um, yeah, there's one billion trees, and I think we're going to get some money from them as well, and just lately the, the PGF and more money from them. So, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities out there currently. I don't think they'll be around forever, but we are going to try and capitalise on those where we can. Um, and, even, and Adrian, as he said, he's still got this regional council money as well. Um, I'd like to thank that King Country River Care that we propose an alternative model to Plan Change 1. We're going to have Plan Change West Coast come our way in the next few years, quite fast, if this current government has their way. We call it Plan Change um, maybe 2 or 3 or 4. And we'd like to, say, to, to be able to stand up there and say, look at this, look at our model, and um, we've got communities really working <coughs> to get uh, better outcomes for themselves and their people and their, and their environment. We have a new way of wanting to work with the Regional Council and with Central Government and let's have a look at this model and see what we can do with it going forward. So I guess that's, um, that's King Country River Care in a nutshell. I'd like Rion Very, he's the chairman, he can come up here and, um, come up here and answer <laughs> any questions with me. Uh, or tell me what I've missed, Rion. Part of it, I guess I, I didn't touch on building a database, so building you know, what we've done and what farmers are doing so we can tell a story about what's happening on our farms in our sub-catchment groups and in our wider catchment group. And I probably missed that. We've got eight sub-catchment groups. So the Moko, Awakino and Mangakiwa West, which feeds into the Waipa. And basically a farmer member from each of those groups comes onto our committee. That's the governing body, which meets monthly. And I know Rion always said, and it was a good, good thing to say to farmers, you know, We'll go to all the meetings, we'll try and work away at this policy stuff, we'll let you know, we'll talk to you about what's happening, and you fellas can get on with doing the farming. And I think that's probably been something that's, yeah, is uh, really worthwhile and um, has been part of King Country River Care. So Rowan's put a lot of time into that and um, done a great job. Probably it takes time, to, small steps, and we've still got a lot of wider community to, um, to work together with as we um, try and build those plans going forward. But yeah, I think the catchment planning with the farm environment planning, reflecting those catchment needs and getting your action plans out of that farm environment plan and hopefully some extra funding. Central government look pretty hopeful at the moment to turbocharge those action, farm, action plans on farm so we really get targeted environmental outcomes. That's kind of the next step right now. So questions? How do people get involved? I've got, I've got that question. So Mark and Felicity, <laughs> so we're going to just bring this back to Mark and Felicity a little bit. So you guys are involved with the King Country River Care Group. Why have you got involved and what have you got out of it? Oh, I think it comes back to what Anna was saying, that to make a difference, we all got to do it together. Um, one person can't make do, do, do it on, a, on their own. 
Yeah, it, it's um, we believe in the concept. We think it's good for the community as well as um, good for individual farmers. And we I really just want to see everybody going along together um, to make a difference for the environment. Um, I'm really with Anna about that, that thing about making a better environment for our children and future generations. And I think that the um, catchment groups are an excellent springboard for that. I think it's one of the most effective ways we've got of, of tackling that issue. I think the thing is too that consumers demand what we're trying to achieve. And that's a big thing. If we hope to sell our product in 20, 25 years, whatever, or even now, they demand that it comes from a sustainable farm and that we're looking after the soil, waterways and, and our stock. So if you're a local farmer and you haven't heard from me, give me your email address and you will. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to give you their email address. What are they going to get in return? <laughs> they're going to have to turn up. They have to walk in the door and come to a meeting and they will um, get to have some input into what their catchment plan might look like and what their farm plan might look like. They'll get support to build a farm plan and if they stick with it and get their action plan done, potentially there's some funding available to uh, make that action plan come to life on their farms. Of course, they also get that... Um, viewpoint, that representation, part of the stronger, the voices stronger together and that um, local, you know, we're going to develop and work away at getting local issues sorted with local solutions and putting a local perspective onto policy. Thanks, Rion. Um, and so, yeah, it's all about local solutions, I guess, and, and farmers learning from farmers, supporting each other and then learning from their wider community and feeding that all together. Also, one of, the, one of the main things that we've sort of noticed is that everyone's out there saying, well, you need to tell your story. Well, catchment group's a great way to tell your story. Collate that information and go out and say, well, this is what's been done in this catchment, rather than all trying to be a hundred voices saying, well, I've done this, I've done this. If you can bring it to the catchment level, then it's so much more powerful. And I are you thinking of having or uh, running a few more workshops on farm environment planning? Like last couple of years, you know, we have, we have done a few. Fifteen. Fifteen this year. Fifteen in the next three months. Yeah, lots. So we've got the money from MPI to run workshops. Um, if we don't run the workshops, we give the money back. It's that simple. So we've sort of, uh, King Country River Care, of, um, we're presenting you with an opportunity. Now it's up to the farmers to take up that opportunity. If we, we've got milestones, we don't reach the milestone, we give the money back. It's about as simple as that. I like that. Yes. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Any more? And somebody was asking about funding. Funding is... Aidan was talking about those three catchments where hill country erosion funding was available, but there is funding available for other farmers. Have I know a few farmers out of the catchment. So um, if Grant Blackie is willing to say a few words here uh, about the funding and... Uh, Grant, are you there? It's yeah, Grant, uh, Grant Blackie is, is the manager of our Lower Waikato and West Coast and uh, Upper Waikato. Yes, he is an expert, old soil conservator. So um, I can uh, authoritatively say that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm look after uh, river and catchment management for basically the whole Waikato uh, river system and the west coast now and the different teams that come under that. Um, funding is, uh, well, it's all over the show at the moment in terms of what might happen. Everyone's heard about um, shovel ready projects, provincial growth fund, one billion trees, hill country, what the council has. And um, in another couple of weeks or a month, we will have a much clearer idea of what is actually landing in the Waikato, what's actually available. We know what's available now, but there are so many applications in for billion trees. We've got a, an application in for a couple of million dollars of billion trees money. These guys have as well for, for stuff and there's other applications. So I can't really go into the sp specifics right now. I know on the Feds, Fair Own Farmers website, the PGF have put a pencil line around 100 million for farmers, or groups of farmers, I should say, 
to apply for money for fencing and planting up to 80 to 100 per cent of the cost. Well, those are projects that would need to get underway in the next three months, by the sounds of it, which seems rather optimistic. But that is, um, you know, providing support to groups of farmers, King Country River Care, and other groups like this who are set up and may be ready to, you know, get into it. But we will have a much clearer picture in the next month or two as to the different funding options available for this area. But I won't say any more. Thank you. So I'm, um, I'm thinking, Grant, don't run away. Um, so I'm thinking, when there's money being given away, everyone puts their hand out, right? And everyone wants a bit. So you guys are potentially going to get swamped with applications. Now, as a farmer within a catchment area, should I pin my hopes on getting funding in the next 12 to 18 months and delaying the start of my projects, or should I just progress? I don't think delaying is, is the answer. Um, we've heard from Mark and Felicity about starting small and getting on with it. Um, so I'd say start small and get on with it. If you can get money to help you to grow and do more, that's fantastic. But everyone needs to essentially get on with it. So um, yeah, start small and so forth. Anna wants to say something. <laughs> well, like I said, on our farm, it's 50 years it's been going on and there's still shed loads to do. So I believe get on with it, yeah. Um, I, I really do think there will be some funding coming your way too, but I don't think you should wait. Funding always comes with uh, provisions. There's things that you have to meet, so if you want to be in control of it, then you can do it yourself, of course. Um, um, so the King Country's got a good story to tell, are you happy that the meat companies are telling that story internationally to the end consumer of the product, or is there a disconnect there that needs to be sorted? So I believe we have a choice as to which meat company we supply, and maybe there is a bit of difference there. So as a, as a farming business, I think you need to choose your supplier and make sure their values align with yours. I think some of them are doing a pretty good job of that. Um, I believe we're at risk of not delivering what they're saying, so we all need to really make sure that we are doing what we need to do on our farms. Mark or Felicity might like to add anything. Two more questions before we move on. Uh, da Danny wrote a bit in the paper um, with, with, with a pretty practical solution to planting trees on people's farms that are you know, not going to just be pine trees going wasted. Um, is that able to be tied into some of this funding and, and brought out to everyone? And so Danny Dark, you're referring to in here? Oh, look, I think um, it was a great initiative and it raised a lot of um, profile for the plight that potentially some parts of the country have got with widespread planting. Um, and uh, yes, the answer is yes, it could be looked at and tied into it. But I do think there's an issue there around the fact that it's offsetting pollution and we are, could be seen to be supporting the offsetting of pollution. So yes, yes, uh, we need as communities to look at this and we need to do what Mark and Felicity have done, which is look at where biodiversity fits in on our farm and where planning is the right thing to do. But I'm not certain that we want to go too hard after offering offsetting opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's a, something to work through and it was bloody good to get that out there and the, the, um, the recognition and acknowledgement that she got was awesome, really cool. Last question before we move on. I'll just make a comment before we move on. Uh, so this stream here is a picky Atua stream and it is Wahoo Tapu and we respect that. Um, there was a Par site on the neighbouring property, and years ago there was a huge battle there. Um, a lot of people were killed, and so we respect that the blood flowed into the water and is Wahoo Tapu, so we don't allow any commercial yelling or, or anybody to take anything out of the water. And I think that's important that we all know what's going on in our farms as far as who was here before us and how we respect what they did and things like that. So. Um,
All right, so um, stop number two done. So we're going to head, well, tell us where we're heading, Mark. Uh, we're just going to head across that bridge there, straight down the creek, and um, Bruno is going to show us what he can get out of the creek. But he's going to put it back. <laughs>